Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the second in a series of three SDIGA webinars that are designed to assist service providers with getting active in the Shaken ecosystem. We will begin in just a minute. So let's give it a little time for others to join. All righty then, I think that minute's up. Hope we've got enough time for folks to join. Looks like we've got a good audience. I'm Brent Struthers. I'm director of the Secure Telephone Identity Governance Authority, otherwise known as the STIGA. Uh, before we get started, I want to cover a few ground rules. During the discussion, I will encourage you to submit any questions you may have long, um, you may have throughout the, 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 the presentation today. Um, using the question feature on the webinar controls. We're gonna hold off on the questions until the end of the presentation. Um, and I'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, to submit a question, just type it into that questions box and hit enter and uh, we should see it. Um, in addition, both the slides and a link to the recording today of the webinar will be distributed by email to everybody who registered. Okay. With the ground rules out of the way, let's get on to the real subject of today's webinar. And that is once a service provider has uh, registered with the STIPA, which we covered in the last webinar, how do you go about working with a STI certificate authority? Um, as you can see, I'm your moderator today, and we've got a number of excellent panelists who I will introduce as we move through the presentation. So Sarah, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So what is a certification authority? Um, certification authority is common in, in the world of digital certificates. And uh, they vouch for, and this is directly from the ADA standard 10,080, uh, they vouch for the binding between the data items in a certificate. They issue the digital certificate to service providers and they vouch for all the information that's in that uh, digital certificate. Um, that's the information of the service provider that holds a di digital certificate. So that's a more or less generic definition of a certification authority. Um, what does a certification authority do? Well, it takes care of the entire life cycle of a digital certificate. What the heck is a life cycle for a digital certificate? Um, it involves the issuance. Obviously, you've got to issue the certificate first to the service provider. Um, you could have certificate renewal. Um, certificates have uh, expiration dates. Um, you know, a lot of them are, you know, very common for, for it to have like a 24 hour expiration date. Um, and so you've got to have that, you've got to be able to renew that certificate. Um, it could be a rekeying of a certificate that's different than a renewal. Um, maybe you've got a, a certificate that's been compromised or it's been expired already. And so now you've got to rekey the certificate. Um, you can also have a revocation of a certificate. Um, this could come again from a, a, a key compromise or something a little more serious, a certification authority having, having their, their key compromise, um, some type of an affiliation change, the service providers changed affiliation and, and, and they've got a different name or different identity now. Um, you could put a certificate on hold. Um, you could have a company that ceases operations in the ecosystem altogether. Um, you could also, as a service provider, have your, your privileges withdrawn. And so your certificate would go on a certificate revocation list for, for a lot of these. Um, so let's go through the next slide. Those are just kind of general um, information on digital certificates. Now, uh, CAs, certi certification authorities in the stir shaken framework, where do they play? Um, there are, um, as you see here, a um, number of roles. You've got the STIGA, which is the STI Governance Authority. Uh, you've got the STIPA, which is the Policy Administrator. And then you see the STICA. Um, the SDICAs 
provide the service of issuing the valid certificates, STS certificates, to the service providers, those service providers that have been authorized by the policy administrator. Um, and the policy administrator, of course, authorizes the service providers based on the policy set by the governance authority. You'll note a couple of things on this slide. Um, one is that there uh, are multiple boxes for the STICA. Um, this is a competitive service. There's one STIGA, there's one STIPA, uh, but there are multiple STICAs. In fact, we have six that are approved and five that are now serving. Actually, we've got um, eight that are approved, um, but six of them that will eventually service uh, the, the broader industry. Two of them uh, actually serve their own service provider only at the moment. So there are multiple STICAs. Uh, you're also going to see um, a box in there called the PMA, or the Policy Management Authority. And we're going to introduce you to the director of that in a bit, not yet. Um, and we'll talk more about the, the PMA's role in this whole process. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, the role of the CA, the STICA. Um, the STICA uh, serves as the root certificate certification authority for all STI certificates. Those are certificates that are used in stir shaking to sign and verify the telephone calls. Now there's a difference here. We talk about certificates and I wanna make sure you understand which certificate I'm talking about. When I talk about certificates in this presentation, I'm talking about the certificates that service providers are going to use to sign the call. There's also a certificate that a lot of people refer to as that called an SBC token. The SPC token is not what I'm talking about on this call. All that, you know, I won't talk about it that much. Um, generally, I refer to the SPC token, which is the certificate you get from the STIPA, which says, hey, I'm an approved service provider in this ecosystem. Now I can go to the CA and get a digital certificate, which I will then use to sign calls. So there's the SPC token, and there's the digital certificate, and the, or the STI certificate, and they're both certificates. Um, but they're used for different things. Today, we're really going to talk about the certificate that you're going to use to sign calls or the STI certificate. Um, again, the STICA is a certification authority that's specific to the stir shaking framework. Um, it abides by the STIG or approved policy. That policy is the certificate policy, otherwise known as the CP. Uh, that's available up on the STIGA website. Um, the CA practices and policies that have to be followed um, are in that certificate policy. So every CA has to meet all the policies in that certificate policy. So the CAs have to know that policy very well. Um, the certificate policy is also an evolving document. Uh, we're currently on version 1.1. Um, I think this year we'll probably have a version, well, not probably, I think this year we'll definitely have a version 1.2. So the CAs have to keep up with the changes in the certificate policy and implement those as we move along. Um, the STICA operates under that CPS, which is a certification practice statement. That is um, the certificate policy is the rules that say, here's how you will operate. Um, the certification practice statement is how is something the CA creates that says, here's how I will operate within those rules that are in the CP. Um, the CPS, certificate practice station, statement is approved by the PMA. Remember that box I told you I wasn't going to tell you about yet? Well, here they are. Um, I'm still not going to tell you about them yet. We're going to go through that in a little bit. Again, the the space for the STICAs is competitive space. Um, we've got multiples of those, and uh, you contract with them through commercial arrangements. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, once you've done your shopping and determined, uh, uh, let's let's let me hold off on that. So the, the revocation. Um, so when, once you've done your shopping and determined which CA you want to use, um, where you you uh, want to engage, um, you can get your certificate that you use to sign calls. Um, you want to be careful with the certificate. You want to use it appropriately. If you don't, you could face revocation of, remember I talked about the SBC token, you could face revocation of your SBC token, which would automatically invalidate the certificate you're using to sign calls. And so what do I mean when I say um, you want to use your, your certificate appropriately? Well, you want to behave in the ecosystem correctly. You want to make sure you're continuing to adhere to the SPC token access policy, meaning right now you've got to have your direct access to TNs, you've got to have your OCN and a 499A file. Um, in the future, that direct access to TNs is going to change to certification 
on the FCC's uh, robocall, what they call robocall mitigation program certification database. You've got to be listed in there um, when the when in a, when the FCC actually creates that database. Um, so if you fall out of that database or um, if uh, you give up your OCN or something, you're no longer um, qualified to obtain an SBC token. And so, you know, that'll be taken away from you and your certificate will no longer be valid. Uh, there's also funding requirements, not for the CAs, but for the PA. You will pay your STI PA fees on an annual basis. Um, if you don't pay those, um, you can be, you know, put out of, taken out of the, the ecosystem again. And then there's the, the shaken specifications. This is really important. You need to adhere to those shaken specifications as closely as possible, so you need to know them. You need to know what calls get A, B, and C level attestation, and you need to take that seriously. You need to make sure that you really do know those customers who have the right to use those phone numbers, and that uh, you know if you're verifying them as as you know valid users of those numbers, that they really are valid users of those numbers. Um, otherwise, you, you could get your uh, your SBC token revoked, which would cause your SB, STI certificate to be unusable. Okay, we can also have, let's say you, you run afoul of some court or FCC or some other body with relevant authority um, due to some violation of a caller ID law. Um, you know, they could, they, they would, they may come to us and say, hey, you need to get this provider out of the ecosystem, in which case we'd have to do a review of uh, your right to have access to that SBC token as well. So there's a number of reasons you could lose it. Um, basically, you just want to make sure you're behaving according to the, the shaken specifications and doing all the stuff you need to do um, to be a good good uh, provider in our ecosystem and you won't have any issues. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, the STICA approval process. Now, you could decide that you want to be uh, your own STICA. We actually do have a couple companies that are their own STICA. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that. Um, it's not the easiest process in the world, but I want to bring on um, Eric Shatina. Um, Eric Shatina. Um, Eric, you want to turn on your camera and your mic and join us here? While Eric's doing that, uh, I'll just introduce him a little bit. Hi, Eric. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Eric is the crypto security principal engineer, and he is also the PMA director. He's an experienced security professional with over 30 years in the information security field, including 14 years in uh, corporate information security consulting and project management, and 13 developing software and hardware crypto systems for the National Security Agency. In other words, Eric knows his stuff. And Eric is the uh, head of the PMA. So if you decide you wanna be your own STICA, uh, this is the man you're gonna have to make sure uh, has all the information he needs. And there's a lot of information here. So as, uh, as the head of the PMA, Eric, I would like, let's go to the next slide, and I want to ask uh, you to briefly discuss what it takes for a service provider to become their own STICA or for any entity to become an STICA. Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks for the intro, Brent. So um, I guess from, from our perspective, um, the process is that you submit a, um, a CPS to us for review and approval, um, and we compare that to the certificate policy. Um, and determine whether or not you're going to be compliant. Um, we go through a process of, of review and revision on that, um, and then ultimately, once the CPS is approved, you're able to submit um, a root certificate uh, to us for review. Now, that sounds like a simple process. Um, the work is obviously in taking a look at the certificate policy statement, uh, the certificate policy, the CP, um, which goes through all of the technical requirements for you to run your own CP, and let, yeah. can we talk about registering with the PA first? Because there's a there's uh, a process that you as a service provider have to go through to register with the PA to become an authorized service provider. But there's also a oh, process right, right, right. To go through right. as a CA. So, so that is um that is essentially um you know filling out some forms on the on the website. We take a look to make sure that you have uh, uh, an OCN um, that you're um you know you have direct access to phone numbers. That you have uh, I think a uh, an FCC form 499A, right? And um, and so all of that information is um, is is reviewed, validated um, in that in that web you know web form, um, you know prior to being accepted as part of the uh, part of the ecosystem. Right. So there's separate processes for registering as a service provider and then as an STICA. So once you register as a service provider. If you want to be a certification authority, you've still got to go through that registration process again as a CA. Right. So, and this is the, you can go to the I Connective website 
um, to do that. That's the easy part. Um, now Eric was getting into the tough part, which is the CP and the CPS. So let's go to the next slide, and, and uh, you know, Eric, you talk about now you can talk about that. Thank you. Right. So, um, so the CP, the policy statement, is is all of the requirements around running your own root CA, right? So that includes technical requirements like the types of algorithms you're going to be able to support, um, the way that you're going to stand up your CA, um, all of the you know the technical security controls. Um, logging, auditing, um, having disaster recovery, how you're backing things up, um, how you're protecting your audit logs, um, you know, having dual control or multiple control so that you know, one person can't make a, a change to a, to a particular CA, how it's being protected. If you think about all of the network security requirements around um, running a network and then add on to that all of the requirements around uh, managing your, um, your encryption keys, how the encryption keys are, are generated, how they're protected, you know, how they're how they're how they're stored, how they're backed up, right? All of those requirements are in the CP, and so you need to go through and understand that, um, understand how you're going to be um, deploying your own CA, and then write what's called the certificate practice statement. The certificate practice statement is is the document you give to us that says this is how we're meeting those requirements that you laid out, and so that has to have enough. Um, technical detail for us to have a level of confidence that you've looked at the CP and then you're actually meeting those requirements. Um, and at some point we're actually able to go to, to request you know, an audit of that such that we can come in or that such that an auditor can come in and, and take a look at the deployment um, at the CP and at, at what you claim in the CPS and make sure that all of that jives. Um, so you know that process is not simple because it requires that you have the technical capability to stand up your own um, root certificate authority you know to a level of trust that, that that's not going to be compromised and that that can be relied upon as part of the ecosystem thank you and uh, if that doesn't sound complicated enough for you um what do you mean it is i mean the the, the process um how long would you say it's probably it's taken us on average to to get cas reviewed and, and approved uh, to get their CPSs reviewed and approved? Um, I mean, the ones I've been involved in have been, you know, on the order of, of maybe months or less. I think that's probably the least part of the process. I think the, the larger part of the process is behind the scenes when companies have to go and they have to look at the CP and go, okay, how are we going to do, you know, all of the requirements that are in these? You know, how are we actually going to deploy that and then we have to write a document that shows uh, the PMA that we're actually adhering to that. And so I think that's the much longer, you know, that, that is not is not a month long process. That is a that is a significant process. Right. And and then you've got, like you said, you've got to adhere adhere to what you put in the CPS that shows you're 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 behaving correctly within the ecosystem as a CA, because the the CAs can be removed from the ecosystem as well. Correct. And because the CAs are the root of trust. Um, so there's, you know, a very high bar set to become a CA and to maintain that. Wonderful. So, um, anything else you want to tell us about the CAs and ongoing? I mean, once we, as we as we update the CP, um, you know, the the certificate policy will be updated. The CAs got to need to go back and re, and rewrite their CPS, right? The CPS, just like the CA, just like the CP, the CPS is also an evolving document. Correct. And as I mean, sometimes um, just that, you know, the security um, environment will change, you know, algorithms will change, or we'll, we'll come to understand ways that maybe the system is being gamed, that we need to, you know, include new requirements within the CP. So as we learn and as we see the systems deployed and the ecosystem grows, we'll see where the, the pain points are, and then we may adjust the CP in order to address any issues that we find. And I'm glad you said that. You said that as the ecosystem grows, this ecosystem is growing, right? We this is a brand new ecosystem, the Stir Shaken ecosystem. Um, the Shaken standards, if you remember the IPN and I, you well know that the the Shaken standards continue to change, and new new items get added to them all the time. So um, we are part of a growing ecosystem that's not been around for 50 years. So you can't expect that uh, um, everything's going to stay static, and you can you can write your CPS and, and forget about it. Okay, great. Um, let's uh, let's move on to the next slide because if you've decided 
now that um, after after hearing from Eric, if you've decided now that uh, you you don't want to be your own STICA, um, well, you can do it if you've decided you don't want to do that. Uh, let's talk about uh, how you find the list of current STICAs and and how you decide who you're going to work with. So, Sarah, can you go to the the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay. So the following STICAs have been approved by the STIGA board um, to serve service providers within the, the stir shaking ecosystem. We've got MetaSwitch, NetNumber, NewStar, Peering Hub, Sunset, and TransNexus. Um, the official list can actually be found on the uh, STIPA website at that link. And don't you don't have to be virtually write the link. Again, we'll make these slides available um, after the presentation. Um, probably the, the recording and everything will be available tomorrow. Uh, one of those, Peering Hub, has not um, turned their service up live. So at the moment, you've got five of them uh, that you can choose from. And let's go to the next slide, and I'll introduce you to our representative of the five CAs. So, gentlemen, if you could turn on your uh, cameras and microphones, uh, we will have uh, Dr. Peter Brown, product manager at Metaswitch. We've got Travis Ruthel, uh, Director of Systems Engineering at Sansei, uh, Doug Rinali, founder of NetNumber, Ken Pollitz, Principal Product Specialist at Newstar, and Alec Fenichel, Senior Software Architect from TransNexus. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. And uh, you may recognize some of these folks from, from the first webinar if you attended that. Um, a number of them were on the first webinar as well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through some uh, questions and answers and uh, you know, jump in if you, you feel like giving an answer or you want to have some debate. So uh, here we go. Um, all right. So we know who the STICAs are. How, as a service provider, do I pick between one STICA and another? What are the differences? Is cost the only factor? Are there other factors that I want to look for as a service provider? Go ahead and jump in. Sure, Brent. This is uh, Ken. I'll jump in. So, uh, <clears throat> first, thanks for this opportunity. Um, my family thanks you as well because it's convenient shower day, so that worked out perfectly. Um, <clears throat> just a little background. Just, <laughs> just a quick, uh, just a quick background for context. Um, just <clears throat> New Star, you know, was one of the uh, first initially approved CAs back in December 2019, and we had actually been. Um, providing shaken certified and compliant certs ever since the launch of the test bed, the ADIS test head back in 2018. Um, we, uh, we've um, been providing these certs to you know, our customer base for shaken, and then uh, we've started offering that commercially to non-NewStar uh, certified caller customers uh, in June of 2020. So that, that business is um, well up and running for uh, folks who may, uh, may not be using our solution for shaken. And then we're also the um, the only approved CA in Canada right now as part of the ecosystem up there. So um, it's interesting being involved in this for so long. Um, it, it seems like, and it's a kind of a good news. It's a good news story for service providers, quite frankly. I think to say it's competitive is kind of an understatement from a CA perspective. Uh, it seems like we've merged, you know, from you know wondering if we would have some CAs initially be part of this ecosystem. To the point now where I think um, new entrants are just kind of uh, coming in to basically provide a complete solution for their customers. Um, we've kind of uh, don't see this that we see this as a kind of a um, ROI neutral business. This is not something that um, you know, given the cost to invest to make um, you know to meet the CT and the CPS, um, we're offering this as really more um, for supporting customers as part of a complete solution. Um, this is not something that the industry is going to make a lot of money on with uh, STI certificates, at least. But um, it's a good news story for service providers because you have a lot of choice. And you would know that um, as long as the, um, the PMA has properly vented, vetted everybody, um, you've got a, um, you know, a, a strong set of requirements that, that everyone has to support from an from a infrastructure standpoint and a personnel perspective. To meet those requirements on an ongoing on an ongoing basis, so um, <clears throat> you know, cost is definitely um, a, a factor. Um, you know, people do ask that question: How do you differentiate? You know, across different CAs. But um, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think you know, 
the CAs have a role in helping maintain the integrity and security of this ecosystem. Um, there's a cost to do that. And, and, and I think this certificate aspect of it might be taken a little lightly in terms of, you know, it's kind of a checklist item for, for folks to get in to start signing, you know, signing their calls and, and being part of the ecosystem. But um, they should know that there's um, a lot behind that to, that helps maintain the integrity and security of this um, of this ecosystem. So, uh, you know, I mean, the, the factors other than cost, I mean, you know, service, um, the, the, the breadth of offerings, perhaps the interfaces that are supported um, and, and also what other capabilities and, and services that that particular, um, you know, vendor offers as part of maybe a complete bundle and stuff. But that uh, that would be my take on it. All right, anyone else want to jump in? I'd say among Sansei customers, you know, um, API integration is a big one. And then also, you know, ease of use with the platform. How easy is it for me to administer, manage, and uh, train staff? And then what level of integration you support? Because everyone's looking for that automation, and that's another big one that's driving our decisions too. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd echo Travis's comments there that it's it's about simplicity. So uh, we created the, the MessSwitch mess STICA to ease the transition for customers that are using uh, our in-network queue call, which is available for our higher end and medium sized customers and which has been around since 2018. And also for our customers that are using the hosted Call Guardian authentication hub provide uh, provision which we provide in combination with transaction network services TNS and to be able to simplify the transition of customers using real STICA certificates uh, we created the STICA and that uh, that means we've simplified the processes by which they're able to onboard effectively uh, and by uh, allowing easy communication between TNS and MISSWITCH and MISSWITCH STICA we have within the terms of our CPS bounded it to that set of customers and that's in a reverse of know your customer it's know your supplier so you know where you're getting your STICA from we know also exactly who we are providing our certificates to and that's obviously fundamental to the uh, integrity of the uh, star shaking ecosystem as we've already heard thanks so much all right thanks peter doug alec you good or yeah. brad i'll go ahead and i'll right. go ahead and follow up on that that Following Peter's comment about simplicity, we think that most of the service providers that we work with will never actually in, will never actually interface with our STICA. That service providers are on the hook to sign calls and verify calls. The STICA is a component of a solution. You need a certificate, so we tightly integrated it in with our call signing and call verification services. So once you sign up for call signing and verification, whether you use that with in-network technology from NetNumber or a hosted service, either way, the SDICA function is just integrated. So you don't actually, there's no work for the service provider. Now we did choose to expose a public interface and we chose to embrace the ACME protocol interface because that's what was standardized within ADIS. And I'm, I am pleased to have seen that we had several third party vendors show up to certify against that ACME interface. So I see lots of great uh, work going on in the industry of vendors stepping up to try and simplify life for service providers and effectively hide all that complexity of the SCICA. And so I think that's most likely the way most service providers will consume it. Thanks, Doug. And Alec, any final words on this topic? No, I think really it's all been covered pretty thoroughly. All right, great. Let's move on. We've actually got a question that I want to go to. It's an audience question, and, and I like it. It fits this one. Um, can we view, this is from Sharon Warren, can we view the CPS statements, um, the certification practice statements submitted by the CA? I'll, uh, I'll answer at least for, for TransNexus. 
Um, so we have uh, two CPSs. We have a public CPS and the CPS that we submit uh, to the PMA. Uh, so the public CPS is of course viewable. I mean, it's literally public on the internet uh, and the private CPS is not viewable. Um, it really contains very specific detailed processes of how vetting is done. We know service provider comes and asks for a certificate. What do we do? Where do we check if you're, you know, complying with with the FCC mandates before we issue certificates, all things like this. Um, so that kind of information is, is just not something that is, is practical to release. This is Ken. That's a good that's a good question. I mean I think <clears throat> we have we haven't really been asked, but I mean if if we were to do that, we would probably just do that under a non disclosure because it, ours we don't have two versions like that. So it's really the same version that we had the PMA approve um, was really is the version we have. Uh, it sounds like that's that's um, CA specific. So uh, you check with your specific CA that you want to talk to and, and see if you can view their CPS. But there's no requirement that they uh, list things publicly. Okay, let's get into some of the little bit more technical questions about um, how how do you how does the service provider when they come to the the CA prove to you that they've been authorized by the STIPA. What do you look for from the service provider when they come to you the first time? So we, we're, we look for a number of pieces of information. We ask, uh, we have kind of a whole form that you have to fill out, you know, to vet compliance with the FCC and regulatory, other regulatory requirements. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we actually go out and reach out to the PA and ask the PA prior to approving any service provider to have a certificate. Um, on our platform, if you have been approved, um, and the the PA explicitly confirms whether or not you have been approved. Uh, I'm not to say that that's a specific requirement. That is definitely CA specific um, at, in the you know, vetting processes. Uh, but we at least will actively reach out to the PA, and then with each certificate that you want to have issued, you do have to supply an SPC token, which means that you're still um, approved by the SDIPA at that time. But before you're even at that point of being able to request the certificate when supplying an SPC token, you do have to be approved by the SDIPA, at least in our platform. And that follows that, the uh, protocol as well. Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, same, same, same with similar to this. Yeah. Yeah, same with us on Newstars Front. You know, the PA is the source, and we've had this discussion with several examples in the past won't bring up names, obviously, but um, I think, you know, the, the PA is kind of the trust anchor around the, um, the, the, the allowance or issuing the credit card, let's say, into the shaken ecosystem. And we, we rely on that heavily. And then we rely on the standard, you know, mechanisms that, you know, uh, make sure that, that there's a valid token and, and all the expirations and all those kinds of things. But uh, uh, that, that's kind of what we do as well. And, and, and not that this would ever happen. Uh, but if, if uh, let's say, you know, I'm a service provider and I'm working with a, a third party, a consultant, um, what would happen if the if the consultant came to the CA and said, hey, I have this SBC token, uh, I want a certificate using this SBC token, and, and it's not, you know, the, the consultant's not the actually working for the service provider, and you can't prove they're working for the service provider. What do you do in that case? So, Brent, is that a hypothetical? <laughs> it's a hypothetical. <laughs> Um, I, I see a little laugh over there. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we actually, the PA will actually uh, allow us to get, get us a contact associated with the, uh, the token as well. So we do a cross check on that. We'll actually reach out to that person as well. We do some vetting on the front end on, on that for sure to make sure that we're dealing with someone who's with, you know, we even check domain names on email address. You know, we, we, we do some checks around that up front between the person who's actually coming forward for the the certificate as well as the the company and the registration with the PA. So we would not approve, you know, that we would do that due diligence. Even if they're a contractor, we would go back and see who registered with the PA and get and work with that direct contact. And from our from our point of view, there's a technical restriction in the case you just mentioned there, Brent, which is that we require the SPC token to have been signed by the service provider. So uh, unless the service provider had provided that particular communication private key to their contractor, we wouldn't have been able to get that properly from them. So 
the mechanisms that we use, I think, may be a little different than, than what's been described here um, so far, at least. The uh, when you register uh, t with TransNexus, at least as a certificate authority, you go through that registration process. You never actually supply an SPC token. With each request to have a certificate issued, you must supply an SPC token. And we give you a specific fingerprint that we expect to see in that SPC token. So when you ask for an SPC token from the PA, uh, you have to have an SPC token. When you ask them for the PA, you supply the fingerprint. They will give you an SPC token. When you then give that to us, for us to issue a certificate, the fingerprint has to match the fingerprint that we supplied you. Uh, and that fingerprint is specific to your user account. Uh, so if someone were to have an SBC token issued uh, and then come to us and say, hey, I want a certificate, that SBC token is, is never possibly going to be valid uh, because it, it would not have the fingerprint. We, we wouldn't have even told you what the fingerprint it should have in it. Uh, and those SBC tokens are one-time use. Again, that's specific to TransNexus. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, but when we issue a certificate off of a given SBC token, we will never accept that particular SBC token again. You must give us a new SBC token if you want a new certificate, which means that every time you want a certificate, the PA effectively approves that and positively affirms that you are still an approved service provider, um, just as a, a really secure vetting mechanism. And when you say fingerprint, you're not talking about uh, you know ink on the finger and paper. You're talking about a digital fingerprint, right? Yes, sir. So it is a SHA-256 hash um, that is supplied to you, and it's SHA-2 starts with SHA-256, and then it's uh, 200. It's hex, actually, is what it is. Um, it's uh, the value in the SPC token, which is a JSON web token, is called fingerprint. Yeah, and <clears throat> this is kind of new star. We do the same exact process with the fingerprint. I mean, it's just an added security, and uh, also it kind of you know leads into the kind of Acme world, you know, in terms of using the account credentials as a fingerprint and, and tying another linkage between the uh, the actual person requesting the certificate and the actual CA. Anyone else? Yeah, so Brent, we, from NetNumbers perspective, we, we went straight to embracing the Acme protocol. So we don't allow a service provider to give us a token. I understand exactly what Ken and Alec are talking about. It's a, a step before Acme. In our case, the token is passed as part of the Acme protocol exchange, and it's impossible to pass it to us unless you control the private key that was used to generate that token. So the only way you could get around this is if you stole the service provider's private key. Peter, Travis? I our just echo what that as well. Trouble. Oh, I was going to say our process is very in line with what's been described there as well. It sounds sounds like we're we're all very close in in protocol here. Yeah, I'd echo the same comment exactly about one-time service provider code tokens in particular. Okay. Uh, all that to say that um, if you are working with a consultant on this, and I know there are service providers that are working with a consultant, make sure you are well coordinated uh, before you go to your your CA and request a certificate um, using a service provider's SBC token. Um, Ken asked if that was a hypothetical, and, and it is, but it's not. We've had that instance, and, and it took a good bit to sort out. Um, but the bottom line is the service provider was not able to get its certificate until the, the consultant was completely verified that they were working with that service provider. So make sure you come in with your uh, ducks in a row, please. All right, uh, let's go on to the next question. Um, how do other service providers know to accept the calls that I sign with the STI certificate that I get from, from my CA? I think you answered that earlier, right? I mean, the <clears throat> once it's approved, you know, they, they provide their root certificate, part of a CA list that um, the actual um, providers or any, anyone, I, I, don't, I, I know in some places, I think it's public, it's a public URL. Um, so you can retrieve those root certificates as part of your verification process. Then you can do chain validation back to that root, and, and you should be able to then uh, those certificates should be um, um, accepted, right? So as long as this, the CA is part of that process of registering, gets that root certificate once their CP is approved, then uh, that information becomes available for anyone to be able to verify your calls that are signed using those credentials. 
Anybody else? I just oh, add that uh, Ken's absolutely right, of course, that that's the process. We, we get asked uh, a lot for uh, customers who have already been in the ecosystem, have been using self-signed certificates for a while, and are understanding how to transition from that to the SDICA process with root certificates that are provided directly from the PA uh, and downloaded by the SPs onto their whitelist. Uh, and that's obviously different from what the customers have already been using potentially for some time when they've been service providers have been around for a while and uh, you know, using star shaking from the very early days. And so they're surprised therefore to be able to not have to be able to provide root certificates to their peer carriers. That's obviously what that process does away with. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I, I wasn't going to bring that up, but uh, yeah, Peter brings up a good point. I mean, we've got a we've got kind of an eco a mixed ecosystem out there, and what what by not using an approved CA, you create operational work for folks because it, it, these these are now have to be manually loaded into trust stores to allow those calls to be signed and maintained, um, you know, through through throughout the um, the ecosystem. So this becomes, I mean, the mechanism put in place is a perfect mechanism for managing a group of approved CAs if that's all that is issuing the certificates, but that's not the case yet. We look forward to the day when that's the case and uh, moving everyone to just using standard compliant SDI certificates and um, also with some level of consistency, which um, which, um, tr which we um, also would like to see in terms of the information associated with identifying the entities and the um, issuers of those certificates as part of the, the certificate signing request and such. Okay, I think we beat that horse to death. So let's talk about certificate assignment. Um, if I as a service provider want multiple certificates, can I have multiple certificates and why would I want multiple certificates? We, we actually see that at Sante quite a bit and um, I see it for various reasons. Some people are splitting out business units or regionalizing. And I think it also offers some layer of redundancy should a SPC code become uh, compromised or, you know, in some way so that you're not compromising all traffic at one time. So some people in business units, you know, like retail versus wholesale and things of that nature. Yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing, Brent. Either it's a different certificate based on a different uh, segment of your network, could be regional segment or it's line of business. I use this certificate for my wholesale traffic, this certificate for my retail traffic. I think I, I, I would, we promote more of what Travis was saying in terms of um, the risk factor, right? So <clears throat> by um, spreading these out as opposed to as a management tool, more or less a uh, risk um, mitigation, right? So, you know, companies have multiple entities, um, Sometimes they just want to um, be able to ensure that if they're instead of using one certificate for everything, that they have the ability to, if something does happen, you know, on some portion of that network or some entity, that that doesn't doesn't affect all their traffic, you know, all the signing of their traffic. Yeah, and I add on the risk mitigation, we also have interesting cases where customers are worried, particularly when they're wholesaling, they're sending C level attestation across the network. And they're worried that the certificates that are used to sign that traffic is going to in some way be deprecated when the reputation of that traffic is analyzed by analytics engines. And therefore having separate certificates for the C level traffic as distinct from their A level traffic is something we've seen a desire from from our customers. Interesting. Alec, you wanna chime in on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think everything that's been said is is very, very accurate. And I do just wanna emphasize a common point of confusion that we hear is that if a service provider maybe acquired another service provider or for whatever reason has multiple OCNs and they're go they so we frequently hear that service providers think that they have to have multiple certificates and the calls that originate using numbers owned by one OCN have to use the certificate that matches that OCN and, and, and the other one has to use the other. Um, and everything that's been stated about why you may choose to have multiple certificates is very accurate. However, uh, you do not have to have multiple certificates. There is absolutely nothing that would prevent you from a technical or policy perspective from having one certificate should you choose to do so. I know that's a very, very common point of confusion that I hear. 
Excellent. Hopefully that was helpful for folks. Um, what about uh, how, what what about um, duration of the certificates? How long do they last? Um, why would would I, why would I want a why might I want a shorter term certificate versus a longer term certificate? What's the difference? So, I believe the CP states that certificates can last up to two years, if I recall, or it may be three. Um, but uh, at least for TransNexus, we will issue certificates that are valid from one day to 365 days, one year. Uh, we do not issue certificates that are longer uh, than valid for longer or less than that that time period. Uh, and I, we're we're big proponents of shorter lived certificates. Um, we we find we think that the using short lived certificates really helps with keeping certificate revocation lists small and ensuring that you have an automated process as opposed to a manual process. Um, and minimizing the risk of a compromised private key that you may not be aware of. Um, if someone, you know, a rogue employee were to steal a private key, uh, you didn't know about that, that employee leaves the company uh, and may not do anything for a month, two months. If you've rotated that key every day, then you know, you know that that key that is useless at this point. The certificate's long since expired. Uh, so we're big believers in that um, personally, although you know, we do offer certificates up to one year. That's the same process for Sansei, one day to one year, and we, we definitely are on the same page with promoting you know, daily refreshes for security purposes. Highly recommend that. Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess this is a debatable topic, but um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I, this seemed to be kind of a schizophrenic reaction within the, uh, the, uh, the standards group around thinking that, you know, we're going to get a bunch of bad actors in here with steal, getting SBC tokens, getting other people's certificates, compromised private keys. Um, I, I don't think we're seeing that yet. I, I, I think, you know, there's a lot more operational experience to gain here. Um, you know, all for, you know, full automation and, you know, meeting customer, you know, needs if they feel like they need short term certificates and such. But um, uh, we, we promote mostly a one year certificate. I mean, I think the last thing people want, you know, unless everything is totally set up right with alerting and everything like that, the last thing people want is that um, operations call that an SSL cert that went down in some server that wasn't renewed. And, you know, you're you got a you know, you got an operational issue. I mean, the same kind of thing applies here to some extent. You got to have, you know, all the, you have to have a full process in place, not just the automation of the of the platform, but all the uh, uh, learning and operational capabilities to make sure that, uh, that this is all being done properly. I mean, I think we'll get there. I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not saying I'm not against, I'm not, a, not saying I'm uh, against short-lived certificates, but, you know, given where we are with this ecosystem and, and what we're do, trying to do, um, you know, with two-year, SBC tokens typically, I mean, I, I, I just don't see it, uh, a business need at this point, and that may change. So uh, I'd echo what Ken said there. We're generally seeing customers asking for uh, uh, certificates with long-lived expiry periods to minimize the, any operational concerns, and so they effectively don't have to worry about that. And as Ken said, there's two sides to that argument. I, I, Possibly we are going to see short-lived certificates desire, desirable, particularly for the delegate certificates case, but uh, mainly at the moment we're seeing long-lived certificates being uh, the ones that are being requested. And that's same a great point, thing. Peter. I, yeah, I was just, I'm sorry, thing. just to say that that's a great point for that Peter made about the enterprise. If we start getting into these other models with other participants and delegate certs, then I think that, that that's a driver. Yeah, same comment from that number. On the enterprise side, where we built a solution that has net number controlling the private keys for our enterprise customers, we issue only 24 hour delegate certs. So we went with short lived. But on the service provider side, in general, we don't see service provider customers having the infrastructure today to support appropriate management of short-lived certs. So if the service provider is actually doing it, doing the work, we see them request longer-lived certs and we do one year. And I guess you could say that's the long and the short of it. Sorry, that's a very bad pun. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. 
Uh, there, there are some audience questions. I've got a few more questions, but I want to get to one of the audience questions first that was relevant to the discussion we were having. We were talking about uh, multiple certificates. So I will read this from David Butterworth. Does this last conversation account for telcos that have geo-redundant or disaster recovery sites to handle calls during a disaster on one site? Our instant uses one SBC at one site and an alternate standby SBC, not SPC, but session border controller at the geo site. Would we need two separate cert certificates? Anyone? So I'll go ahead. Go ahead, Alec, please. Well, I was just going to say, you know, you, you definitely do not need two separate certificates. Uh, but one thing, you know, just from a security perspective, uh, it's best whenever possible to try and generate the private key. Uh, and then, of course, the CSR with that on the particular machine that needs the private key. Uh, if you're going to, you know, generate a private key somewhere and then move that private key to various different machines, you need to have a, a secure mechanism of doing so. If you have automated software that, you know, that's one thing. So in the event that you have, um, you know, a way of securely transmitting a private key to multiple multiple machines, multiple SBCs in this case, assuming your SBC is doing the signing, then that would make sense to use one certificate. Uh, but if you do not have the infrastructure to securely move a private key around various places in your network, uh, it may make sense to use multiple certificates such that the private key is actually generated on the SBC. No person is, you know, moving things around. You definitely don't want to be emailing your private keys around to get them installed on various SBCs. So you do need to be very cautious of that. And I think that's really more of the, the reasoning you might think about having multiple certs more than anything else. There's no policy or technical um, issues outside of that. Doug, you want to add to that? Yeah, actually, I think that was, I like that was perfectly said. In this particular example, I the fact that the customer asked this question indicates that they don't have the infrastructure for securely moving those private keys. So go get two certs. Each SBC has its own private key, has its own cert associated with it. It's no problem for the industry. It's an easy answer. All right, anyone else? Okay. Let's move on to the next question. Um, let's see, as, as an authorized service provider, um, are there any rules I need to follow regarding certificate use and what are those? We talked about those a little bit earlier, but anybody else want to elaborate? I would just say I, that, you know, I, I think, as you said, there's a there's a commercial agreement, at least with Newstar on top of the CP and everything else that you spoke about. Um, I think the our service order is, you know, pretty, pretty streamlined and, and, and really just reinforces some of the key points around, you know, the certificate policy and, and, and what's expected of the CA. Um, but I mean, different companies may have some different aspects, commercial aspects. So I think that the only thing that they would, uh, um, you know, need to need to understand is anything addition, you know, anything that's in a contractual relationship, you know, between the, um, with, between them and the, and, and the, and the CA, as well as their contractual relationship or user agreement, I guess, with the PA, right? That's kind of, I, I think, the, the overarching art guidelines that uh, that the service provider needs to pay attention to. Anyone else? Yeah, and I would expect that the agreement that the service provider is signing with the PA probably already restricts them, that they're only to use it for shaken purposes, not supposed to use it for securing other aspects of their network or other types of communication. My guess is that's probably right in that service agreement with the PA, but I wouldn't be the right one to specifically comment on that. Okay. Thank you. And and within the company, within the service provider, that means that, you know, probably few people are going to have access to the actual certificate, so it can't be used for lots of different things within the company. Yes, no? All right, nodding head. That's not yeah, awesome. yeah. So, so the, <laughs> so, so the the certificates. Um, I'm not sure what the policy uh, that the uh, STIPA gives to the service providers, but I do know that the CP states that certificate authorities can only issue certificates for the purpose of shaken signing, shaken signing calls for shaking. 
Um, now that CP doesn't really apply to a service provider. It applies to a CA. Um, so so that's kind of a little funny of a situation, but I think as, as Ken uh, and Doug have, have alluded, it, the, the contractual agreements I think will end up pushing that onto a service provider. We are only allowed to issue certificates that are being used for the purpose of signing shaking calls. So if we as a CA were to find out you were using certificates we issued, we would not be allowed to issue certificates anymore, even if we wanted to, because we are not allowed to issue certificates that are used for any other purposes. Uh, of course, there's not a technical way of us preventing that, um, but th that is th the purpose of these certificates is for shaken and shaken alone. Okay, thank you. Um, we talked about revocation a little bit earlier as well. Um, you know, do you guys want to elaborate? I gave a quick list on why a certificate might be revoked. Um, there are reasons for, you know, revoking that are related to, you know, somebody misusing the certificate or other reasons that, that could just, you know, hey, this just happened and it wasn't anybody's fault, but we've got to revoke the certificate. What are some of those reasons that a certificate might be revoked? Uh, I, I think on the service provider side, you know, you, you could see where customer PBXs or things of that nature are hacked um locally there and calls are generated that would be signed typically that you'll see you know where someone could then mark that traffic as fraudulent and that may be an, an issue so in that case that's a compromise we've compromised the certificate so i want to get a new certificate and um so I, so you know my certificate's no longer compromised i've got to get a rekey but that doesn't mean the provider is going to be kicked off the <laughs> kicked out of the ecosystem for any reason that's just a reason to get a new certificate so you have one that's not compromised okay any other reasons i think just to add to that i think you know a critical thing is as a service provider if you know you have a employee that had access to a private key right I, in general avoid individual people having access to private keys as much as possible and have them be systems um, but it you know sometimes it's just not possible to avoid that and that employee leaves the company, you may want to revoke the private key, or if, especially if something bad happens and, and that involves the, the employee leaving the company, that's definitely something to be very careful about um, because while, you know, the intention I, I don't think with the PA is to, uh, you know, revoke or revoke or service providers access, if there's a, a mistake like that, you know, you do need to be part of the problem, solution, not the problem and revoke those certificates. So there's not a lot of robocalls. And I think if you were consistently having your private key compromised and not taking action, it was being used for robocalls, um, I would expect that to be a problem. So in general, if, if there's even a small inclination that the private key may have been compromised, the best practice should be to revoke the certificate, issue a new one. There's really no negative impact. You get a new certificate, you sign your calls with the new certificate. The old calls that were already signed are done. It's there's you don't need that old certificate anymore. I would I would urge service providers to revoke and have a new certificate issued if there is even the slightest reason to, to think that it may have been compromised. Nothing good will come of waiting. Right. So revocation yeah, is I not think... just a bad thing. It's a security procedure in in most in in the most common instances. Yeah, but I think the CA role is kind of limited in that, right? I mean, the CA has the ability to revoke a, a certificate through the PA, and in the U.S., the service provider will go directly to a PA. So some of these use cases are probably more driven by the service provider, not the CA, because I'm not the CA would not have that visibility to. to I mean, they could help facilitate perhaps, but um, you know, there's I think there's a less a less of a role here for the CA in in re requesting those, you know, unless there was, you know, some kind of provisioning error or something like that. I can't, I think a lot of the, the, the use cases we would want to protect against or would, would, would use revocation for would probably be generated outside the CA. And, and yeah, to add to that, the, oh, I'm sorry, I was just going to say that the, the CA is not necessarily involved in the revocation process. If you know you need to revoke a certificate, I'm sure all the CAs here would assist with that process. But you, as a service provider, you can go straight to the PA and have that certificate revoked. I really wanted to get to one more question, but I don't think I've got enough time. We're right at the top of the hour, so uh, you know, yeah, I will uh, thank you all for uh, thank all my panelists, um, including Eric, who's who's off, um, who's off the the camera at the moment for for joining us today. Um, the next webinar in the series, as you can see it on, on the screen there. 
Um, it's going to cover the, uh, it'll, it'll cover, what do I do now? Now I've got, I've signed up with the PA, I've, I've got my, my CA and my certificate, I'm ready to sign calls, and now what do I do? This is all about, uh, you know, how I work within the Shaken ecosystem going forward. So there's your registration link again, it'll go out with the, with the slides. Um, and uh, then we've got the, the last slide there, Sarah, you want to show that? Um, this is just a thank you. So thank you again on behalf of the STIGA and Addis for joining us today. Uh, I want you to have a terrific week and um, be safe and COVID free. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all on February 25th for the next webinar. Thank you again to the panelists, um, everybody for joining us today and y'all have a great, great week. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Thanks, Brad.